great. Well, thank you all this morning for joining us for the Lives of French Impressionists with Mary Woodward. We are probably all familiar with French Impressionist paintings, the sun-dabbled uh, haystacks by Claude Monet, and the fresh young faces captured by um, Renoir. Uh, come learn about the artists behind the paintings and the fact that many of them were friends, roommates, and or rivals. For example, we know that Gustave Calabé uh, paid Camille Pissarro's rent on more than one occasion. And we know that Claude Monet was a pallbearer at Edouard Monet's funeral. I, I, you know, I took uh, French, I dropped out eighth grade <laughs> French, so I, I did not, um, I apologize in advance. That's uh, okay. Or I guess after the fact. Uh, Thank you. I, uh, for we'll some reason I took Latin, which was a big, big mistake. Should have taken Spanish. Lesson oh, learned. No. Uh, so their lives and artworks were intertwined in a way that is hard for us to imagine today. They were at once both competitors and colleagues. So this morning's presentation is led by art historian, Mary Woodward, who serves as a guide at several historic New England properties. She previously served as public programs coordinator and educator at the Concord Museum. Uh, she has a BA in art history from Furman University and an MA in art history from Emory University. She has 40 plus years of experience in museums of all shapes and sizes from the comprehensive collection to the Cleveland Museum of Art to the one room log cabin birthplace of President James K. Polk. And uh, just a note that uh, I think uh, all of you, but particularly the folks in Tewksbury and Andover will enjoy um, Mary's um, uh, last portion of this morning's presentation where she has a bit of a surprise for us. So I I'm do. gonna just uh, pique your interest and that's all that's I'll right. say. Out. That's okay. right, there's a the tickler. There's a little bit of tickler there, yeah. So all 63 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mary for joining us this morning. And Mary, I'm gonna finally be quiet and you can take it away. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Robert, again, for that introduction and for inviting me, um, friends of Tewksbury Library to be with you today, but also our friends in Andover, Essex, Medford, and Tingsboro. It's wonderful to have this community to together. Uh, and we are here to talk about the lives of the French Impressionists. And as Robert said in the introduction, we're familiar with the sun-dappled gardens and the fresh faces painted by Monet and Renoir. But we're going to learn, but what do we know about them as people, these artists? And the answer is actually quite a lot. Um, we do know that Claude Monet's rent, for instance, um, was one of several people who had his rent paid for on a regular basis by the other painter, Gustave Caibo. And we know that uh, Edouard Manet, for instance, stood up as a witness uh, and best man, if you will, at Henri Fantin Latour's wedding. Their lives and artworks were intertwined in a way that's hard for us to imagine today. And they were at once colleagues and competitors, patrons and pallbearers for one another. So in this illustrated talk, we're going to have a look at the art as well as their lives. And I've selected works that I think are particularly insightful about their personalities. Uh, and here, just to run down, I've given just a quick list. These are the artists that we're going to be talking about today, beginning with Edouard Manet, the eldest one in the group, and ending with Gustave Caibo, who was uh, the youngest. And as a quick glance, you can see that there are two standouts for me, and that is that Claude Monet and Mary Cassatt each lived to until 1926. So uh, think of the changes in the world around them that they saw from the mid 1800s to the 1920s. Paris was one of the places for those changes. Paris was at the center of Impressionism. It was a new city after 1870, after Baron Haussmann's reconstruction of the city center into broad boulevards and parks and grand places that we see today. The French economy was growing and transportation to the countryside was more available. Modern life had a new style and a new pace about it. 
The artists that we're going to be talking about today, the Impressionists, were generally against the style of traditional academic art of the previous centuries, away from mythology and history paintings, away from highly finished smooth surfaces. The Salon in Paris had been the official arbiter of taste since the 17th century. It was the stamp of approval. And the Salon favored conservative traditional styles like this, the work by Charles Glier. Interestingly enough, he ran an art school and a number of the Impressionists first attended art school at Glier's. But this was the style that the Salon approved of and this is what was popular. Since exhibiting at the Salon was a way of being accepted into and becoming successful, many young artists, including our Impressionists, continued for many years to try to be accepted by the Salon. Eventually, though, they turned to staging their own exhibits, eight of them, in fact, in order to promote their art and their new visions of leisure time, modern life, fashion, and society. The group's name, the Impressionists, came from a derogatory comment that was made in the press at the time of the first exhibit in 1874. That exhibit featured this painting by Claude Monet called Impression, Sunrise, and the name stuck. But actually for the artists, they felt that it perfectly summed up their aims. Impressionism, it's a big name for a range of styles, similar styles and themes, but there are two main aspects that most of the Impressionist artists um, had the, uh, you know, felt together. And one was the desire to depict modern life. And the other was the desire to paint out in the open air, capturing the bright, pure colors and light filled scenes in that way. Uh, they were inspired by photography with its ability to capture a fleeting moment. Um, and they were inspired by a whole new aesthetic that was coming into their view, appearing from the East. Japanese prints uh, with their flat blocks of color and their unexpected angles and viewpoints. Along the way, the Impressionists created a new kind of portrait. Informal settings, activities that, depicted, that were depicted with the immediacy of life, the settings and the gestures and the clothing actually defined the individuals because unlike traditional portraiture, the Impressionists were not painting well-known important people in society or government. Instead, for the most part, they were painting their friends and family. Edouard Manet was a wealthy young man. His father expected him to be a lawyer. That didn't work. Then they tried uh, for a military life for him, but he failed to be accepted into the Navy twice. So after that, his father let him move to Paris and study art instead. Manet was an extrovert. He was warm, he was generous, people gravitated to him. He was the natural center of the group that became known as the Impressionists. Manet met Edgar Degas. They met one another in 1861, a year that Manet's painting that you see here, the Spanish singer, was actually accepted into the Salon. Manet was feeling confident. He even offered Degas advice on his art the very first time they met at the Louvre. And amazingly, Degas took his advice graciously. Manet convinced his new friend to stop copying the old masters at the Louvre. You know, if you've been or any museum uh, back in the day, you would see people set up with easels, have permission to copy the paintings there. Manet told Degas to stop doing that. He said, you need to portray the world around you instead. Manet was self-assured, but things always came harder for Degas. He, Degas even told an English writer once, damn Manet, everything he does, he always hits off straight away while I take endless pains and never get it right. Well, 
The following year, Manet really did hit it off with this large work called Music in the Tuileries. The scene is the weekly concert held in the gardens near the Louvre. Fashionable young Parisians would flock there to see and be seen. Manet made open air studies. In other words, he took canvases out and, uh, and papers and he did open air studies, but he put this enormous painting together in his studio. He did not drag this giant canvas to the park. And Manet is representing, um, he presents portraits, not of famous people, but of his friends. So allow me to switch slides to this one which has features some circles. So going right to left and starting with the gentleman on the right half of the uh, painting, that's his brother, Eugene Manet, seen in white pants there near the front. And if we progress to the left a little, we see Henri Fantin Latour pictured in the rear with a round gray hat, a sort of bowler hat on his head. If we go to the next circle to the left, we see Frederick Basile, another painter in a top hat standing next to a tree. And Manet includes himself all the way over at the far left, also wearing a top hat. And Manet is always easy to spot because he almost always has that reddish beard. I mentioned the top hat because at this point it was a relatively recent invention and it was a fashion signature for a new kind of man about town. In French, he was a flaneur. We would call him a dandy. Manet was, um, as one author wrote, the reluctant leader of the Impressionists because he always sought official approval from the Salon. And truth is Manet, even though we think of him as the leader of the Impressionists, he never did exhibit in any of the eight revolutionary Impressionists exhibits. The following year, thousands of works were rejected by the conservative jury of the Salon. So Emperor Napoleon III decreed that all works could be shown in an alternative exhibition, which was nicknamed the Salon des Refusés, the Salon of the Refused or Rejected Works. Manet entered this painting, his Desjardins sur l'herbe, and it's luncheon on the grass, basically. And uh, well, it, it shocked everyone. People were astonished. Uh, they didn't understand if it was meant to be a joke or if it was meant to be a real scene. They couldn't figure out what a naked woman was doing at a picnic with two clothed men and what in the world was the woman in the background doing. The interesting thing is that the public didn't hate it or object to it because she was nude. They seemed to have a larger problem with the fact that the men were wearing modern clothing. This was clearly not a scene from antiquity or mythology that they were used to seeing at the salon, but it was a scene taken from modern life. As one author says, and I quote, the ambrosial world of nymphs and shepherds has been gate crashed by a pair of vulgar day trippers. Uh, the two men, one was uh, Manet's brother and one is his brother-in-law, by the way. Well, two years later, Manet entered Olympia in the official 1865 Salon and it was accepted, but he wrote, Abuses rain on me like hail, he wrote to a friend. Officials were worried for the safety of the public because there was a great deal of crowding around in front of it to laugh and to mock at the painting. And so they uh, decided for the public safety and perhaps for the painting's safety to hoist it high up on the wall uh, to keep it safe, they said. But if you know the salon, that was also um, it was called skying a work that also meant that the more unpopular pieces might be put very high up on the walls. The painting met with, as one author says, an unprecedented, an uproar, unprecedented in the annals of art history. Here again, the Parisians weren't shocked by her nudity. They were shocked by her attitude, her defiant confrontational gaze straight out at the viewer. 
She was a prostitute looking right at them eye to eye. Manet really suffered emotionally at the response to this painting. He wrote, no one knows what it is to be constantly insulted. It disheartens you and it undoes you. Now let's have a look at his companion, his buddy, Edgar Degas. Degas was also born into a well-to-do family. His mother was American, but died when he was young. And so he was raised in a family full of men, his widowed father and two widowed grandfathers. His family expected him to become a lawyer as well. That was a popular uh, wish for parents at the time, but he wanted to study art. So he took classes at the official art school in Paris, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. He was sarcastic and shy, one author says, uncomfortable in his own skin. Degas never married. He seemed to have harbored some fear that uh, for an artist anyway, a woman um, would, could disarm his talent and that if a married artist with a wife and children to support, um, they might end up having to paint just whatever would sell and compromise their talent as a result of being saddled with a wife and family. So that meant that Degas looked at marriage from the outside and with a rather critical eye, he saw the problems and complexities. And that attitude comes into play as we look at this painting here. In 1886, Degas painted a double portrait of Edouard Manet and his wife, Suzanne. He was very close to both of them. Degas expresses his feelings in general about marriage and in particular, I think, about his friend's marriage here. He focuses some intense scrutiny on their relationship. And what do we see? Well, in the original painting, when there was all of it there, we would see Suzanne preoccupied. She's sitting at a piano and she's turned her back away from her husband. Manet is on the couch. He appears to be preoccupied as well, perhaps thinking of someone other than his wife. Was he mad at his wife? Was she mad at him? Degas gave them the painting, but at some point later, Manet sliced it apart. One explanation offered was that he didn't think it flattered Suzanne enough, but was there more? Perhaps Degas had too clearly represented the strain in their marriage and Manet didn't care for that. When Degas discovered that the painting had been cut, he took it back. He went home and in a huff, he sent back a small still life that Manet had given him. But he couldn't stay mad at his friend for long. So he patched the painting intending to repaint Suzanne, but he never got around to it. He regretted sending back the still life. And when he asked for it back, Manet told him he'd sold it. They stayed friends after this. It's hard to imagine, but they did. But they did continue to compete with one another really the rest of their lives. Degas felt that the point of portraiture was to get to the real person behind the facade. So often his portraits are, one author says, disturbingly frank. He liked to show his subjects in mid-thought. He found many suitable models among his fellow cafe goers. His famous scene here, Absinthe, shows two cafe patrons sitting at a table near him. And you can see we are sitting in the place that Degas is actually sitting. That's our table, his table right in front of us. And he's looking across at his friends. One author has described her as, and this is, this is really choice, oozing the lethargy of someone on the way down. That greenish milky beverage in her glass is absinthe, a powerful alcohol, about 150 proof. The model was actually the popular actress, Ellen Andre. And the man beside her is a friend of theirs as well, Marcel and Debuton. And in front of him, a drink which would have been recognizable to everyone who saw the painting at that point. It's the modern hangover cure of the day. Many of the Impressionists lived in the same section of Paris called the Batignolles. It's, it's near uh, Montmartre, it's to the north of the center of town. 
The area was full of cafes. Uh, Manet, as I said, the oldest of them, he held court each night at Café Gerbois, which is number 10 and is sort of in the center left of the map there. Uh, and the regulars there included Degas and a few more we're about to meet, Basile and Fantin Latour. Eventually Monet and Renoir both came too. Cafe life was certainly one aspect of modern life that the Impressionists wanted to capture. Um, the scene that we just saw of absinthe was uh, painted at number 11 on the map. So in the lower right bubble there, you see you know, the Cafe Nouvelle Athenae. Cafes were more than just a place to socialize though. Years afterwards, Monet described them as a place where he said, we laid in supplies of enthusiasm that kept us going for weeks and weeks until a project you had in mind took definite form. He said, you always left the cafe feeling hardened for the struggle. But respectable ladies weren't supposed to go to cafes and bars, even ladies who happened to be artists themselves. Berta Morso and her sister Edna were actually encouraged by their father to study art and to pursue it as a career. They studied in a Paris studio with a teacher because they weren't allowed to go to the official art school. Um, and the teacher wrote their mother with this warning. And I wanna quote his letter to you. He says to her, given your daughter's natural talents, it will not be petty drawing room talents that my instruction will achieve. They will become painters. Are you aware of what that means? It will be revolutionary. I would almost say catastrophic in your high bourgeois milieu. So in other words, women weren't artists and nice women were certainly not supposed to be artists. The sisters met Manet and Degas while they were studying and copying art in the Louvre. Manet was taken with Berthe Morso and it seems it was a natural attraction. However, Degas, who wasn't already married, tried courting her. He gave her a fan that he'd painted and she cherished the gift, including it in a double portrait she did with her sister in 1869. And you can see it behind them on the wall. Manet put her off of Degas with some veiled comments about his not being capable of loving a woman. Well, she must have been somewhat conflicted when she finally did make her decision to marry because in 1874, Berta Marisot married Manet's brother Eugene. So Edward Manet at once was her mentor, her friend, somewhat of a tormentor to her and her brother-in-law. Manet remained interested in her over the years and over the course of his lifetime, he painted Berta Morisot 14 times. Morisot eventually began, uh, she got fed up with trying to win official salon approval. And so she helped put, uh, she helped by putting her energy into organizing the Impressionists' own exhibits. And she participated in seven of their eight shows. Now, Degas, and Manet met another artist while studying at the Louvre who joined their group. He was Henri Fantin Latour. Fantin Latour was born the son of a painter and moved to Paris to study art. He became very close to Manet, keeping up letter writing and sitting for portraits for one another often. This portrait that he did of Edward Manet is a masterpiece. Manet is the flaneur, the dandy, the cool observer of life. He's now in his mid thirties. He's regained his confidence after weathering the storms over his paintings, Déjeuner sur l'herbe and Olympia. There's something of his personality captured here. He's strong, he's forthright, but that he's kind and generous. Um, and he seems to be caught off guard. He's, he's in the moment. The painting is inscribed to my friend Manet. And the two men remained close the rest of their lives. As I mentioned earlier, Manet stood up with Henri Fantin Latour at his wedding. And then several years later, Henri was one of the pallbearers at Manet's funeral. 
just as a, a little aside here, Fantin Latour met the American uh, painter, James McNeil Whistler, whom he described as a strange individual in a bizarre hat, but the two of them became good friends. And in Whistler's book, he writes of a story of the two of them painted a, a large floral painting together and then tried to sell it one day in Paris, first on the right bank, uh, at galleries and then across the bridge to the left bank galleries. And they went back and forth all day from gallery to gallery, walking back and forth over the bridge. And by the end of the day, feeling frustrated with their failed efforts to sell the painting, they paused in the middle of the bridge and they pitched the painting into the river. Fatin Latour painted this scene called a studio in Batignolles, and it was accepted into the salon in 1870. And I think you can see why. Um, it's an homage to Manet. That's, that's really not why. The, the style, though, is um, fairly conservative. The colors are rich, deep. Um, he had painted a very smooth surface here. And even though it is modern life and not mythology or history, it is a pretty staid look at this group of artists. Um, that is Manet in the center there. And um, number one with the, oh, here, here we go. Number one is uh, Renoir. And number two is Basile. We'll talk about him next. He's always the tallest one. And number three in the shadows over to the right is Claude Monet. Now, Frederick Basile was also uh, supposed to be something else. He was supposed to be a doctor that his father planned for him to be, but instead he left to study art in Paris and almost instantly met Renoir and Monet. Since Basile's parents sent him money uh, and his friends needed money, he asked Renoir and Monet to share his studio with him and it was close to their school. In this self-portrait Basile did, you can see that uh, just how talented he is, but you can see him capturing that spur of the moment, that fleeting glimpse. This is impressionist portraiture at its best. So several years later, Basile moved into the Batignolles district uh, where most of them had gravitated to be closer to the cafes and things that they liked. And this group portrait, he painted um, that same year, but it was not exhibited at the Salon. It's much more informal. And um, the studio at Rue de la Condamine. And so going from left to right in the left corner, sitting down, that's Renoir. On the steps, it's Emile Zola. Of the three men right in the middle, the one on the left is Monet, Claude Monet. In the middle, shorter with the reddish beard, Edouard Manet. And the tall one, Basile himself, and then their musician friend is over to the right, Edward Maitre. They're seen in a casual environment of the shared studio that they had. Basile painted the whole painting with the exception of his own image, and he had Edward Manet paint that for him. In fact, even though when they weren't sharing a place to live or a studio, Basile was still paying people's rent. When Monet's first child was born to his mistress Camille, Basile was made godfather to baby Jean, and Monet, Monet didn't waste a minute to ask the new godfather to help support his new godson. So the story of how Edouard Manet met Claude Monet is a memorable one. When Olympia, our portrait of our prostitute. When Olympia was accepted at the Salon of 1865, Manet thought his luck had turned because it was accepted into the show. And on opening day, many people rushed up to Manet and congratulated him on the success of his painting, his seascapes. Well, Manet was confused and he went to see what they were talking about. Two seascapes by a painter named Claude Monet. Manet was upset, thinking that this unknown was using a name close to his, and there's Manet on the left, Monet on the right, using a name close to his in order to gain attention for his work. But he was soon to learn who Claude Monet was. Claude Monet 
was a 24 year old painter with two works accepted in his first try at the salon. He was from Normandy where he'd been working as an artist in his local town. He was inspired to paint outdoors by an early teacher of his and that became a hallmark of his. When he moved to Paris, he shared the apartment with Basile and soon Renoir joined them. Monet was cocky, ambitious, and very talented. Fresh from his success at his very first salon try, he began a large work called Women in the Garden, where his ability to capture the effect of light on colors and on fabrics was clearly in full view. This work was rejected by the salon jury, but his wealthy friend Basile bought it and then paid Monet back in installments to sort of help him get along. Sadly, Basile didn't live much longer. When the French went to war with Prussia in 1870, he joined the army and he was killed in battle a week before he turned 29. The Basile family gave this painting to Manet in exchange for a portrait of their son. And then Manet returned the painting of women in the garden to Monet. It was a very special work to him and he kept it with him for the next 50 years. I just uh, will throw this in. It's just been undergoing um, a conservation and a renovation in Paris. And so you don't often see it out of the frame. And certainly this is a view you wouldn't see when we gets back on the wall, but it gives you some sense of what a large painting it is. And to know that happily it's being well loved and cared for still all these years later. In 1872, Renoir and Monet both decided to go back to the Louvre, scene of many of the group's happy meetings, and they decided to paint, but they weren't interested in copying the old masters on the walls of the museum. Nope. Each of them set out oh, Renoir in the spring and Monet in the fall, each set up their easel at a window on the second floor cafe, and they painted the modern life outside below them. Parisians coming and going over the Pont Neuf bridge. Renoir even had his brother model for him um, twice. Walk, you can see him in the lower um, right center, really lower center of Renoir's painting. He has a dark jacket on and light pants and um, a walking stick and straw hat. Renoir actually told his brother to stop people on the bridge and ask them what time it was. Uh, or ask them to check his time uh, watch against theirs in order to get them to stand still so that he could quickly paint them. Degas met Mary Cassatt, where else? At the Louvre, and he immediately admired her talent. Cassatt was from a prominent family in Pittsburgh. She trained at the prestigious Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia and uh, went on to Paris like the rest of them. In just a few short years, she was having works accepted into the official salon. Degas invited her to join the group of impressionists and participate in their shows. In Boston, we have um, the, this double portrait, the tea from about 1880, showing two women sitting quietly having tea. But they're not posed traditionally as portraits. Instead, it's a fleeting moment captured here on canvas. Their faces are actually obscured, so not a traditional portrait at all, but a modernist, impressionist portrait. She exhibited in four of the eight exhibitions the Impressionist exhibits. And Cassatt posed for Degas for this portrait, but this one was so unusual that it may have strained their friendship. In about 1884, he portrayed her casually slumped forward with her elbows on her lap, holding what appear to be picture cards. Now, this is where it all hinges. If those are calling cards, carte de visite, in other words, you go to someone's lovely home, they're not there, you leave your calling card, and they often had a picture of you, you want it. If those are calling cards, then that's perfectly fine for her to be holding them, but many people saw this portrait and thought that those were fortune-telling cards, and therefore, the Degas was portraying her in an inferior social setting. 
He gave her the portrait, but years later, she was hoping to sell it. She wrote to her dealer saying, I especially desire not to leave it to my family as being me. It has artistic qualities, but so painful and represents me as a person so repugnant that I would not wish it to be known that I posed for it. I should like it to be sold abroad, but without my name being attached to it. But when he died in 1917, she wrote this. She said, I am sad as he was my only friend here and the last great artist of the 19th century. I see no one to replace him. Let's look at Renoir. Renoir was born in the French city of Limoges, famous for its painted enamels. He moved to Paris and he trained to be a porcelain de decorator. But by the age of 20, he had joined uh, the school of uh, Glier, where Basil and Monet were as students. And then he was also officially admitted to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. In spite of this uh, grumpy, serious look in his photo here, Renoir seems to have had the sunny, positive personality that most of his paintings have. This is dancing at the Moulin de la Galette. It's Renoir's view of an outdoor music venue that was so popular with Parisians. Moulin means windmill and galette is a griddle cake that's made from the grain milled at the windmill. Windmills in Paris, you say? Well, yes, this part was a rural part of Paris with vineyards and dairy farms all around. This was painted the same year that Degas painted Absinthe. So I, it does, I think, give you a sense of um, an indication of the themes that attracted the two artists and a difference in their personalities. One of them is sunny and upbeat, the other more voyeuristic and direct. Renoir's Luncheon of the Boating Party is one of the most beloved works of Impressionist painting. Renoir used recognizable friends, um, and one of his best friends is seated here in the front. This is Gustave Caibo sitting backwards uh, in his chair in his sleeveless white tank with his straw hat. He purchased the painting we just saw dancing at Moulin de Galette to help his friend out. The young lady sitting opposite with the dog on the table is Alain Charigot, who married Renoir years after this painting. The two people leaning on the rail are brother and sister, and it's their parents who owned the restaurant they're in. The woman drinking at the center that you see sort of midway into the back, uh, looking straight out at us is Ellen Andre, looking better than she did when Degas painted her in absinthe, don't you think? Renoir worked on this ambitious group portrait over a succession of Sundays because getting everyone together was impossible at once. They were gathered on the balcony of their favorite Riverside restaurant outside of Paris to the West. The spirit and the atmosphere is a joyous celebration of life and food and friendships and scenery. Renoir said, to my mind, a picture should be something pleasant, cheerful and pretty. Yes, pretty. There are too many unpleasant things in life as it is without creating still more of them. Renoir didn't make a fortune painting portraits though because he said, my models were my friends and I did their portraits for free. Now, as I mentioned, seated at the table there is this man, Gustave Caibo. He was born into a wealthy Parisian family. He was a great painter, but he was also a great supporter and collector of their friend's art. He actually started as a lawyer and he served in the Franco-Prussian War, but by 1873, he was studying art in Paris. He was invited by Renoir to participate in the second Impressionist exhibition. He showed eight paintings of his own and he purchased three of Monet's. His painting, Paris Street, A Rainy Day, is another masterpiece. A quick glance at a busy street scene, figures cut off, figures moving in space, he set the scene in the heart of their part of town, an intersection of two broad boulevards in the Batignolles Quarter. 
He studied perspective. He may have even used photographs and he did many, many sketches in order to create what appears to be an instantaneous image. It was really quite well planned. The lovely couple in the front are typical of the day, each dressed in the height of fashion. He is the flaneur in his top hat. Look at the way that the rain-soaked cobblestones reflect the colors and the lights. It's, it's really fabulous. Um, and he's included a bit of danger, a bit of movement. Look over to the right. Are there umbrellas about to hit one another? It's a fabulous little thing he's included in the painting. Um, and as a personal note, maybe some of you have as well, been watching um, the Netflix series, The Gilded Age, but in the one I watched last night, oh, look what's behind that character. It's an image of Gustave Caibo's painting. Now, Caibo was an accomplished sailor and rower, and he painted portraits of his friends out on the water often. He died at the young age of 45, though, having spent more time at the end of his life boating and gardening than he did painting. In his will, he gave his collection of Impressionist paintings, not just his, but ones that he had purchased from his friends. He gave them to the country of France. And Renoir was the executor of his will, and Renoir had to fight with the conservative staff of the Academy of Beaux-Arts to accept the works. Uh, but in the end, 38 of his, of Gustave Caibo's Impressionist collection were displayed together at the Luxembourg Palace in Paris. Meanwhile, Monet at this time was spending less time in Paris and more time enjoying at a rented country house in its big garden. Manet came to visit Monet and his family one day. And while there, he picked up a paintbrush and a canvas and he set to work recording the light and the shadow and the color as Mrs. Monet and her son sat on the grass. And there's Claude Monet in the background with the watering can. On that same day, another friend happened to pop in, Auguste Renoir. And this is what Monet wrote about the day. He said, during the sitting with Manet, Renoir arrived. He too was caught up in the spirit of the moment. He asked me for a palette, brush, and canvas, and there he was painting alongside Manet. Manet was watching him out of the corner of his eye and from time to time went over for a closer look at the canvas. Then he would made a face and he passed discreetly near me and he whispered in my ear about Renoir. He has no talent, that boy. Since you're his friend, tell him to give up painting. Monet thought this was funny. Monet painted his own vision of this scene featuring Manet at his easel. When the visitors finished their paintings that afternoon, they gave them to Monet and his family. And so here we have a wonderful moment in time of three amazing artists working together in the same garden. Nine years later, Manet died at the age of 51. Monet and Fantin Latour were pallbearers. Olympia was the first of his works to enter the collection of the Louvre, and that was only due to the tireless work of Monet, who campaigned for a year to raise money through public subscription to buy it from the Manet family and give it to the Louvre. After Manet's death, the group seldom got together. They exhibited together as the Impressionists one more time in 1886. Caibo stepped back into his suburban life of gardening and boating. Monet lived in the countryside. Renoir and Degas each pursued different subjects. They were doing better financially and they had less to prove to the world. They didn't need each other for support monetarily or emotionally or professionally. But as they grew old, they looked back at their lives and recalled each other with fondness and genuine affection. Monet reflected that in a quote, I, I would have given up on many occasions if my old friend Monet, one who does have a fighter's temperament, hadn't been there to put me on my feet again. Manet said of Claude Monet, 
When it comes to water, he's the Raphael of water. He knows all its movements, whether deep or shallow, at every time of the day. Mary Cassatt said that the first sight of Degas' pictures was the turning point in her artistic life. Degas, walking in Manet's funeral cortege, summed it up for many of them when he said, he was greater than we thought. And Monet, I'll end with this quote. He says, everyone discusses my art and pretends to understand as if it were necessary to understand when it's simply necessary to love. So with that, I will stop and um, uh, maybe have Robert come back on. And if we want, then I can show some pictures of um, my surprise. Or Robert, you can tell me if you want me to do that now. Thank you. Uh yeah, great. So thank you so much, Mary. Let's take a few questions. Um, okay. Let's, let, let's yeah. do questions first, then we'll do this. Yes, I thought that'd be better. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. Uh, so Liz asks, uh, why do you think Impressionism began or came into its own in France? Uh, good question. Um, as opposed to, uh, well, there were, I mean, there, there were artists doing similar things. It's really more a question of, how did it's the it's the source of impressionism that we relate to although there are artists who we call american impressionists um i think it came into being there because there was um this strong change in their lives uh from a totally agrarian um to a fast-paced and modern life and it just struck the artists that uh, they were, you had a young, a group of artists who came along at about the same time who, while they didn't paint exactly the same, they all agreed on um, not wanting to follow the traditional academic path. And so while works of Impressionism tend to differ from one another, as I said, we, they do hold those two basic ideas that they wanted to paint modern life and they wanted to paint outdoors in a way that hadn't been done before. So I think it was just a, a, a coalescing of things, but some of it brought about by the massive changes that were happening in Paris in the middle of the, um, in the 1840s and uh, 20s, 30s and 40s, yeah. Uh, Pat asks, uh, what uh, is the box in the picture Olympia? Um, let's see. What is in the box? Um, is, you mean under the bed? Is that uh, the mattress? It seems to be on a wooden frame. Um, this is the maid coming in. She has a bouquet of flowers from uh, an admirer. It may have been uh, the bouquet that they were referring to, yeah. Maybe so. Uh, yeah, it, because it's angled, that may look like a white box, but that is the maid coming in with the bouquet flowers from a client or admirer yeah um, uh, gail asks uh uh and gail i don't know it might be a typo here uh why is uh can you read that in the q a there uh, mary in the q a box oh. why is oh. fountain bleu oh is that is that a french term <laughs> fountain bleu is a place and um it's uh, where some, prior to the Impressionists, there were some artists who liked to paint outdoors. Um, Gustave Courbet was one of them. And uh, so there were a lot of, um, there's called a school of Fontainebleau, artists who were beginning to do that, but they, what, they were painting outside before the Impressionists, but they weren't painting uh, modern life with as much zest. In other words, they were painting beautiful trees and scenery for the most part, uh, whereas the Impressionists were more likely to go over to the train station and paint the trains, uh, which they did often because um, they liked modern technology and the modern world. Yep. Okay. Darlene says that she loved uh, your last quote. Uh, Thank you. Lori yes. says, I, yep. Lori says, great presentation. Dorothy, wonderful presentation. Uh, let's see, Ron, what a wonderful survey of some of the Impressionist painters, including their lives and works and relationships. Often you visit an exhibit of one, but don't have the chance to learn, compare, and contrast them 
and get that right. interpersonal insight. Right, and it, it is an unusual group. Now I see a question here about Picasso in the mix and he comes later. Um, Picasso really uh, uh, hits his stride in the teens and we first start learning about him just after the turn of the century. So the first uh, two or three decades of the 1900s is when we start to um, see Picasso uh, and his taking art in a completely uh, uh, different way, that's for sure, yeah. Uh, Renee, Renee notes that the two views by yeah. two different artists over the bridge were so different, the buildings yeah. changed and the views changed entirely. Yeah, it, it was nice to see that and uh, I, I, I bet you can't go to a second floor open window in the Louvre anymore, but um, <laughs> it, it would be nice to be able to capture that same view or stand at that same window these days and look out, yeah. Uh, let's see here. So Teresa says, what an amazing time in the history of art. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, very you. interesting and an informative presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, let's see, I learned so much. Thank you. Uh, I love Mary's presentations. Uh, and finally, Angela writes, thank you, Mary. Really enjoyed your presentation. Okay. All right, Mary, well, you, let's get to uh, the surprise, Mary. I was going to say, yes, let me say, so I told Robert about this earlier. So um, part of my connection with Tewksbury has been that my mother used to live in Tewksbury. And um, I recently, um, oh, okay, let's see here. There we go. I recently had an opportunity to go to Tewksbury, England. Now, Robert told me that the a library in Tewksbury, England, and your library in Tewksbury, Mass., did some programming together, which is so fun. And I was I was just there uh, about ten days ago. And if you don't know, um, Tewksbury, England, is a, a delightful market town. Um, at the present time uh, that I was there, it was the scene of a great deal of flooding because it's right by two big rivers, the Severn and the Avon. And my finger uh, is pointing to a newspaper article because that's where I was headed, the um, Abbey and. Uh, Tewksbury Abbey is uh, quite the masterpiece. Um, it is the main thing in town, of course, uh, built more than um, 900 years ago with the, an amazing um, Norman arch there. The window is not that old, but um, it uh, is an amazing, amazing church. And I just wanted to show you a couple of other scenes from Tewksbury because it's a, it is a charming town and beautiful, and I was tickled to finally see it after knowing that um, the Tewksbury, Massachusetts, where my mother lived, was not the only one in the world, uh, but here was another one to see. So that was my little surprise. If anybody wants to um, have some free time and a ticket to go to England, I'd recommend including Tewksbury in your in your visit. Yeah. So Mary, thanks for that. Well. Um... We will uh, pivot back. We do have a few more questions on the Impressionists, Good. and then we'll wrap up in a few minutes here. Uh, Absolutely. Mary, Mary asks, uh, did De Degas and Cesar have an affair? Cesar uh, have... and Degas? That's what I meant to say, yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Um, Mary Cassatt was. Uh, really a high society gal. And um, although she never married, uh, I don't think we can uh, read too much into that other than she was uh, busy being an artist. And But I don't believe they did. Um, I think they were all very close to one another. Um, I think that, um, but but no, I don't, I don't believe that they did. Uh, Liz know. asks, did these artists experiment with brushes trying to generate a different look? Oh, they absolutely did. Um, they painted with their brushes, they painted with fingers. <laughs> uh, and typically we see a lot of short brush strokes. Um, when one of the things that um, I said distinguished their work from what was officially accepted at the salon all the time was that the works at the salon uh, tended to have a very smooth surface. Uh, they were, um, uh, you know, this is what the artist was striving for. Whereas the uh, often the impressionists' works, 
if you're seeing them in person, you can see how three-dimensional they are. The, in, in, like in, in this one that we're looking at right now, these darker blue strokes on the water here, or the orange strokes where the reflection is of the, of the sun, uh, that's lumpy. If we were to stand in front of this painting, it's lumpy. And so they were experimenting with palette knives. They were painting with brushes. They were putting their fingers into it. Absolutely, yep. Uh, Joyce, Joyce, as a follow-up, uh, Joyce asks, did the brush strokes distinguish impressionists from other types of painting? Yes, it, it did actually, I think, um, in that they tended to go with very short brush strokes. They tended to go with repetitive uh, layering them near one another. When you see Claude Monet's haystacks, for instance, none of which I included in this work because he has so many wonderful things. I just didn't. Um, when you see things like that, you almost look at, as if you're looking at each little piece of straw painted in. So yes, those short choppy brush strokes were something that the Impressionists uh, as a general rule um, really liked to use and, and seemed to use across the board, yep. Uh, Linda says the day in Monet's garden with the three artists painting is fabulous. A beautiful nugget of information about those artists. Thank you. Yeah, thank. Isn't that amazing? I mean, and and what's delightful for us and what we're so lucky to have is the fact that Claude Monet lived until 1926, and by the time he was an old man, um, he was a living legend. He was a national treasure in France, and they recorded him. They got him talking. They 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 made sure that um, uh, you know they knew about stories like this. And so when we see uh, him tell you know tell about Monet uh, and man, I mean the, he tells about Manet teasing Renoir about his art and stuff. It, it's it's fabulous. It's a real opportunity. Yeah. Uh, we'll quickly pivot back. Um, Mary taught uh, here in Tewksbury for 34 years. Uh, she was excited to see um, your photos from Tewksbury, England. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mary, I'm assuming you mean you taught in Tewksbury, Mass for 34 years, um, not Tewksbury, England for 34 years, but who knows? We're on Zoom. I don't know. Uh, Jean does ask, where is Tewksbury, England located? It's near Gloucester. So that means it's in the um, uh, southwest or the western part of England. It's not far from the border with Wales. So uh, Birmingham is a big city that's not too far away. Um, so it's, it's west of London and north a bit of there. So um, uh, that's Wales in the picture, <laughs> in that newspaper picture. These hills are probably the beginning of Wales over there. So, um, but yeah, it's near the big town of Gloucester, which we have one of our own as well, don't we? <laughs> there you go. There's a lot of England uh, towns that, uh, yes, yeah. also you can find in Massachusetts. Um, so, Absolutely. Uh, it is noon. Why don't we wrap it there? Okay. Um, so Mary is going to be back with us on Thursday, April 14th at 11 o'clock. Yes. Um, for Art in the Year 1000. We're going to take look, a look back to study the artistic developments, religious expressions, and technical achievements of a number of cultures that were active 1,000 years ago. So that's right. We're, go, we're going in a different direction. I'm really excited. That's right. Bring, um, bring, wear, wear your comfortable shoes and uh, energy bar. It's quite a romp. We're going to go around the world. There we go. Uh, and uh, so folks, look for an email for me, uh, most likely tomorrow, uh, link to the feedback survey, link to the recording, information about upcoming art history programs through the Tewksbury Library. Uh, I'll be coming to you tomorrow. Want to thank Andover, Essex, Medford, and Tingsboro for partnering with Tewksbury for the program today. Uh, great turnout. We had almost 75 people at one point. Um, most of you hung around to uh, see the Tewksbury England surprise. So I. Uh, I appreciate that, even those yeah. that don't live in Tewksbury. Um, all right, well, why don't we wrap it there? Thank you so much, Mary. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Yep, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. See you soon.